William Cohen, founding partner of Puck News, joins us now. Uh, thank you for joining us here today. And um, I, I get the arguments. I could see on both sides here. It's not a bailout because uh, depositors shouldn't have to read their bank's financial statements, maybe. But also this sets a future precedent or sets a precedent for the future, which uh, could be expensive. So how do you fall on this? Yeah, I mean, let's let's be clear. The banks, shareholders and Creditors have, the shareholders have definitely been wiped out. The creditors probably will be wiped out. Uh, so what, there was a major policy shift, right? Change, we don't know how long it'll stay in effect, but you know, before this, anybody with a deposit, a bank account of more than $250,000, you know, they'd stand in line and see what happens and it might take some time before they get, what, 90% of their money back. Now, they don't have to stand in line, they can get their money back. So what you do is you helped a lot of people uh, who banked at Silicon Valley Bank, which is a good thing. You ha helped them get their payroll, uh, small startup companies get their payroll back. Uh, but you also helped people like, you know, Andreessen Horowitz, who probably had something like a billion dollars at Silicon Valley Bank, who should have done their homework, right? Who should have, if you're going to put a billion dollars into a bank for whatever reasons that they do that, which is a very interesting thing why so many of these VCs did do business with that bank, uh, then you should do your homework about you know, the asset side of their balance sheet. And if you don't, you should suffer some consequences. But you know, I guess we'll have to sort that out later because the most important thing was restoring confidence, and I, I agree. But you know, at some point, people have to be held responsible for their poor decisions. Well, and, and maybe just sort of examine how that works. It's illustrative to go back to the financial crisis when you and I got to know each other, which you, you covered that uh, in detail. And that's when the concept of moral hazard was really talked about a lot, that are you encouraging future risk-taking behavior or absolving responsibility in some way by coming in and taking the actions that you're taking? And so maybe let's go back and look. You know, there was a lot of talk about moral hazard at that point in time because of bailouts. It, did it encourage future risk-taking behavior, what the government came in and did in, in 2008? Well, you know, you have to look. It's, it's really kind of an interesting continuum. You know, if you start with long-term capital management, mm. it was in the late 90s, so a decade before the financial crisis. Uh, you know, the Fed did not step in to save long-term capital management. The Fed stepped in to ask the Wall Street banks who were doing business with long-term capital management to step in and solve the problem that was long-term capital management before it became a contagion, before you know, the confidence was wrecked and everybody started freaking out. So the banks did do that, with the notable exception, of, bank, uh, exception of, bank, of Bear Stearns. They did not contribute to that, quote, bailout. That was like $300, $400 million per Wall Street bank to save long-term capital management. Then come 2008, you know, Bear Smart, literally at 10, uh, 15 years ago, the, the government steps in and for the first time ever rescues an investment bank, Bear Stearns, by agreeing to, you know, take 30 billion of the assets that J.P. Morgan Chase didn't want and put them in Pine Street Capital or whatever it was. And then J.P. Morgan bought the rest for $2 a share and then $10 a share. So, you know, creeping government uh, underwriting, if you will, of the financial system. And I think we just crossed another line, for whatever reason, uh, you know, over the weekend by insuring these deposits beyond $250,000. I guess why, I get why they did it. There was a lot of people's livelihoods at stake. I get that. It was in a certain ecosystem. But, you know, you've now also saved the Andreessen Horowitzes of the world a billion dollars. And I, I don't know why we did that. You know, it's interesting to talk about these historical analogs today in the global financial crisis. You mentioned Bear, 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 Bear Stearns failing. I think that was March. Also, the Federal Reserve slashed rates in January as a result of Jerome Curville and the sock gen losses mm. there. That was a That's European... That's a name I haven't heard in a long time. That's right. We're going to relive the GFC right here <laughs> at this desk. Well, the, the slashing of the interest rates actually began after, you know, September 11th. Mm -hmm. It went from about 6, you know, 6 percent down to 1 percent. And that encouraged, you know... Um, the, the, what we saw from 2009 to 2022 with quantitative easing and zero interest rate policy, we saw a mini version of that between, you know, after 9-11. And that resulted in, you know, some extent what happened in 2008 
And now we're seeing a version of that, only kind of bigger, uh, although it's hard to imagine bigger than 2008, but we are seeing consequences now of the zero interest rate policy at the Fed level for these last 13 years. Um, you've mentioned Andreessen Horowitz a couple times, or the other big VCs, big wealthy VCs, that this is viewed in part as a bailout for them. You've long been someone who has reported on these sort of echo chambers of wealth and power, right? Um, and I wonder what you think the consequences of that's going to be, sort of from a cultural perspective or from a policy perspective going forward. You know, we have to see. Policy takes a long time to implement and get created. Uh, I think the short-term consequences, as you guys have been reporting, is, you know, are people losing, again, confidence to some extent in the financial system, all right? And that shows up in places like Bitcoin, which has, you know, surged in recent days. I mean, uh, kind of in a surprising way, as you just said, Julie. And I I'm not sure I get it, but I think our, the financial system, you know, is safe and secure. This is not 2008. This is the Silicon Valley bank ecosystem, the Signature Bank ecosystem. That was more crypto. There were several crypto banks that sort of went under in the last week or so. Silicon Valley Bank was a very unique ecosystem. And why people did so much business with that bank really needs to be examined. And, of course, their own effective lobbying to get themselves exempted from the, the Fed's uh, you know, stress tests, right. which probably would have picked this up. So, you know, they kind of did it to themselves uh, to a certain extent. And whether it was exacerbated by venture capital firms asking their portfolio companies to take their funds out of Silicon Valley Bank. I mean, it had to start with a loss of confidence. It had to start with a bank run, just like it did with Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. I mean, the same thing happens all over and over again. The banking system is based on confidence. Confidence is lost. It's gone. You can't get it back. And when you borrow short and lend long, you know, les jeux sont faits as yes. the French might say. Yes, the jig is up. All right. Thanks exactly. so much, Bill Cohen. Appreciate it.